my arm? Can you hear me? Yes? Okay. So, <laughs> this is a little bit of a mixed bag of everything we're going through <laughs> this hour. <laughs> I'm going to introduce something completely different, which is uh, talking about the WebAssembly component model. Do I have my screen? There you go. Uh, trying to do this is something around 15 minutes. Is well, probably going to be a little bit hard, but let's let's see how how we can do about that. I'm going to talk about things. I'm hopefully going to show you a little bit and then talk some more. Uh, brief introduction. My name is Miguel. I work for a company called Fermion. Fermion is spending a lot of time working with WebAssembly as a server-side thingy, so writing server-side applications using WebAssembly. Uh, we build a framework called Spin, which is about, it's a serverless framework for writing. Um, it's a framework for writing serverless applications, so similar to Azure Functions, Lambda, those type of things. We've also recently did a project called Spin Cube, so you can run these things in Kubernetes. Uh, and in general, we work with a lot of uh, upstream WebAssembly technology, including WASI and the WebAssembly component model. Together with a lot of my colleagues, we have a shared past at Microsoft, so have been working with a lot of the Azure services throughout the years uh, as well. Okay, but on to introducing the WebAssembly component model. Let's just start by doing a little bit of what, what actually WebAssembly is. So, it's a compilation target for programming languages. Many different programming languages can compile into WASM, so there's a common uh, binary format that you get to. These web assemblies are executed in virtual machines on runtimes. So you would use a runtime, something like Wasm Time, uh, Wasm Edge, some of the runtimes that exist. They can now run these Wasm files that you have. The Wasm files are portable across platforms and operating system. Obviously, the runtime has to be native to compiled to uh, wherever you want to run this. But once you have the runtime on those machines, you can run your Wasm files there. And Wasm files can run in the browser, or they can run directly on the operating system. So WebAssembly originally was designed and created for the browser, but with WASI as a specification and the component model, they also now run outside of the browser. And the, the, the main thing to understand why there is a lot of value in this once we go outside of the browser is that WebAssembly as a specification was really defined for efficient execution, so to be fast, and for compact representation, so to be really, really small. Right? That's what you want, anything happening on the, uh, in the browser. You load from a remote host, it's part of a UI experience, so you don't want to have lag and things. So you want things to be fast and you want them to be small. And basically, if you look at two, uh, all of these, uh, or at least the first three of them, it's very much what we do with containers today. Uh, but definitely, we believe that WebAssembly is sort of the new compute workload that we need to use instead of containers, because there's so much money thing, so many things that's going to be much, much better with WebAssembly than containers. So to just give you an example of how this works, so <coughs> the various programming languages that you can use all sort of have in their own tool chain a way of how to compile down to WebAssembly. So if you use Rust, you will part of the cargo uh, uh, build tool you will do there. In .NET, you will have a runtime identifier called WASIWASM. Uh, and would go, or in this case, TinyGo I'm showing here, you basically have a target of WASI. So you can sort of see how the, the getting from your programming language to a WebAssembly is part of that tool chain you're used to. Uh, this is probably also the time where I need to sort of put in a little bit of a disclaimer saying a lot of these things are work in progress, especially the .NET, .NET stuff. I spent the last hour trying to do a, a demo with, with C Sharp, but didn't, didn't quite get there. Um, so uh, language support is maturing. I think that's how we usually talk about this. Uh, if you want to take a safe path, Rust is definitely uh, a good one. JavaScript, TypeScript is also fairly good. And, and in our collaboration with Microsoft, uh, .NET 9 should be uh, the first release to have good support for natively compiled uh, WebAssembly. OK, so that was WebAssembly. OK, so now we have these WebAssembly thingies. We can get them from different programming languages. It's a common format, and we can run them across uh, anything using these runtimes. What is the component model then? Well, really what it does mainly is provide a much, much richer type system than what WebAssembly as a specification has. So WebAssembly only has four types, and there's only so much. Well, we can actually do anything with four types, but the abstractions is going to be like super, super hard. Uh, so really, the WebAssembly component model is providing that rich type system on top. Part of WebAssembly having only those four types goes back to the uh, fast and small thing. Um, so we can build more comprehensive stuff with the component model. 
And what, what the component model also has is its own uh, interface type language called WIT. And basically what you do in the WIT language is that's where you define interfaces and you then create worlds of interfaces. Um, and the, the notion of worlds is, is nice because basically what you describe with a world in the language as WIT is you describe the WebAssembly you created like it's, it's the world that it lives in, right? And the world have a set of interfaces that may be imported or exported, but it's the world that, that WebAssembly needs in order to be able to run. So what that actually gives us is that with the WIT language, we are now able to describe interfaces that we can then implement uh, or offer um, across programming languages, right? So in C Sharp, I could implement a function to take a string and make it uppercase, and then I could write a program in Rust that calls that function in C-sharp. And the way that those interfaces are defined is through WID. So we can start composing applications and functionality across various programming languages, which is what this WebAssembly component model gives us. So in other words, if you think about that the compilation target can be in common across the programming languages, you can sort of think about the component model taking that portability feature and moving it up back up to the programming language so we can basically import libraries written in other languages at this point. Uh, there was an open source talk earlier today. What's his name? Dylan? Dylan Beatty? Something like that? He mentioned briefly Wasi and talked about package managers and the, the one package manager to rule them all could be Wasi. Um, let's see if that happens. Okay, so two ways you can use these components. So what I'm trying to depict here is on the right-hand side, you have the WebAssembly component, and in this case, the small Lego thingies are attached to it. So those are basically two exports that this WebAssembly component has. It exports a main function, but it could also just export a function, let's say, hello, that takes a string and returns a string. If you were to just use a WebAssembly runtime, there are certain conventions of things in a WebAssembly component that runtime would look for. It could be a main function. Uh, and you could just run that directly from the runtime. If you want to use a function uh, like the hello thing that I'm exposing from the WebAssembly here, what you typically do is you build your own host, which basically you take, you, you embed a WebAssembly runtime, and then you load those components in, and then you start calling your functions. And that's part of the example I'm going to show you in a little bit. And that ability to build your own hosts, and by the way, the the point is that the host is obviously then the natively compiled thing that you need to, to use and have that runtime embedded. But basically, you can, you can start of imagining how you can build a host that would look from various implementations and functionality, which could then be provided by WebAssembly components, right? So all that functionality could be written in various programming languages. They could be loaded dynamically as you run your application. Um, and there's a whole area of how this works in terms of security and memory isolation as well that you know, that is just taken care of. Let's leave it with that. And then we can do another talk and talk about security in WebAssembly, but it is sort of taken care of. Like, basically, if you load two components, they have their own, have their isolated memory. There is no memory shared within components, even though they run in the same process. That's the short story. Okay, so you can think about, like, if I had these WebAssembly components, and let's say, you know, some of them imports stuff, some of them export stuff. Now we can start putting these together, and we can come up with various ways of composing applications based on things, and maybe this should lead into a talk of what is good software architecture and what is not good software architecture. But anyways, I think you get the point, right? I can compose my applications and pulling all these things together. Okay, if I want to show you how this works, let's do a quick demo. I've written a host application. Well, to be fair, one of my colleagues <laughs> wrote a demo. I just updated it, and I'm going to show it to you. But there is a host application which is just written in Rust, so it's a native application. It's embed it embeds a WebAssembly runtime. And then it has this width definition. So what it, it is looking for is implementations of a function called transform that takes a string and returns a string. This is width. This is the WebAssembly interface uh, type language um, that you're seeing here. Then on the other hand side, I could actually have three, three different implementations of that, uh, um, of that function that I'm looking for, right? So I have something written in Rust, I have something written in JavaScript, I would have loved to put a C sharp on the last one, and you know, tomorrow it will be there, I'm sure. But basically what they do is they then describe that their world, which is a plugin world, they export that function called transform, taking a string and returning a string. 
And now I can put all this together and I can actually have my host application dynamically load these various transforms as I run this. So let's try this out. Um, are we good enough on fun sites, size for everyone to see? Yes? Okay, cool. So um, what I have over here is I am going to run my host application. So basically, uh, well, was my O was a different conference, but anyways, I can say, let's say, hello, NDC. And my host application, we're looking for these transformer plugins, but none were available. So basically, we're just returning or transforming it to, to the same. Let's go over here and have a look. So the way that the application works is it actually looks for WebAssembly modules in a directory called active. And you can see I don't have anyone in there. But what I actually do have uh, in the directory I'm in right now is I have a few of those here. I have one to obfuscate. I want to reverse and I have one to uppercase. And you can kind of get the idea of what will happen as we as we add this in. So let's uh, try to copy the oop, let's try to copy the uppercase thing into the active directory so that now we actually have a WebAssembly module in and we can go back and we can say hello NDC again. And now we found that WebAssembly and we loaded in our host, we did the transformation, called the transform function, and so on and so forth. And we can go and we can take the obfuscate and we can copy the, I think the reverse is the last one in. And now we can do hello NDC and I'm pretty sure we have no idea what comes out of this. And you can see now all these transforms are then being loaded and being added in and we get exclamation mark CDN star LL star H. Okay? So I hope that gave you really a brief idea of how these WebAssembly and again the components that I was using were written in JavaScript and Rust in this case could be in any programming language. So this ability to to sort of you know create like this is this is really nothing different than just using a library right at the point. I mean there's definitely dynamic loading we can do in a, in, in various frameworks and programming languages as well, but this whole cross thing is is what makes it interesting. But if we want to make something that is useful or the useful reality of this, which is not defining functions that take strings and return strings, <laughs> but, but something more like that, then there are a standardized set of worlds that have sort of been defined to solve common scenarios. So if we go back and think about the program I had, we had this concept of a host, and we had the host that is loading things, right? Now, these some of those would expect you know, a command line interface to be there or a way to handle HTTP requests or a way to put data into a key value store, like you know, higher level abstractions that make sense to when we want to build applications. And if you, uh, if you consider the framework spin, which we built as a serverless functions framework, you can sort of get the idea. There is a host that has been created. You provide HTTP handlers using that HTTP, there was the HTTP proxy interface, which is uh, publicly shared and standardized. So you write a piece of code that takes an HTTP request and returns an HTTP response. You do whatever you want to do. You use whatever programming language you want to use. You hand that over to the framework, and boom, you have uh, an HTTP handler, or an HTTP API, or whatever you want to use that for. That is basically how Spin works. What's even more uh, cool with this is that because these are standards, the HTTP handler that you wrote if it conforms to that world called WASI HTTP proxy, you can run it in various different host implementations that offer that functionality or are looking for, for uh, you know, an interface implementation like that. And in this case, that could be something like Spin, it could be SpinCube, it's another project called WASM Cloud, or NGINX Unit's web server, you can also do that. So the same WebAssembly that is just a short HTTP function handler that you implement, you can now start hosting in various, in various uh, environments. And if we go back and reflect on, I said earlier that like we believe this is a new compute type uh, comparing to containers. Really what containers are today is sort of a fairly low-level API that just describes file layers and processes that run on an operating system. So you can sort of get this idea that we can start building platforms as offerings or you know, in our own uh, environment where we have this much higher level of abstraction of you know, there are just key value stores available or there are just HTTP requests being handed over to the functions that you provide. You don't have to provide full-fledged containers with servers and everything. Uh, one example that I just wanted to pull out because there's also an example code of this out there is, you know, as the shared library thing. Uh, 
this example is sort of showcasing how a shared component down here, which is a component to do AMAC, HMAC uh, signature and uh, verification, how you could consider if you were a webhook, you know, you had a, a service that provides webhook, right? You could basically provide that implementation for verifying signatures to anyone who wants to use your service. So on one hand side, you use that, you use that library to sign uh, the webhooks with a certain key, but then anybody who implements, you know, using one of your, your webhooks, you can just give them the library that actually implements the way to verify the signature that you gave, and they can start writing these in Python on all the programming languages they want to use. And this talks into one of these use cases where really extensibility of plugins to platforms and things like that is a place where WebAssembly component model and WebAssembly in general fits really, really, really well. Okay, so key takes away. WebAssembly, or WASM awesome components, can be loaded dynamically. They are self-contained units of work. They're actually really, really small. I think I said that in the beginning, but I'm going to say it again. They are actually really, really small. Um, if I do a Rust component, I think the ones that I have are around 19 kilobytes. Just that, that function implementation. So that's the component. That, you know, having to throw that around in an infrastructure is fairly... It's fairly cheap. So anyways, they are self-contained <laughs> units of work. They allow interaction across programming languages using these rich contracts without worrying about how data structures are represented in memory, basically portable. And we can compose systems from components. And I think the three sort of keywords attached to this is you have something that's dynamic, you have something that's polyglot, and you can start building platforms that sort of exercise some of these capabilities. Um, in a much, much richer way than what we do today. Um, that was my lightning talk. There are two links here. The first one is the example that I showed. The second one has some other spin component or examples of using components around the spin framework. And tomorrow afternoon, I think it's 4 p.m., it's pretty late, I'm running a workshop, one-hour workshop, where we will both work with WebAssembly and also containers and WebAssembly and containers in unison. And obviously that would involve .NET Aspire because we did a small spin extension, so there's a great local uh, developer experience around that. So if you want to try out some Aspire, some WebAssembly, potentially getting things running in Kubernetes, tomorrow from 4 to 5 uh, there will be a workshop where we will look at that. Thank you. <laughs>